So like I was just talking to my father the other day. He just came back from Australia. And he was just talking about, you know, world affairs, about what's happening, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel. And he was very surprised to see the difference in coverage between Malaysia and Australia. And obviously, right? So that, that's the kind of feeling I have when I try to find some news reporting about American elections in Malaysia. Basically, it's non-existent, right? Yes. <laughs> and of course, if you, you know, switch on to Astro or things like that, you have CNN, you have, um, I, I don't know, Bloomberg. I, I mean, they, I, I don't know what they're reporting. They're not even reporting the substance or what's happening. But this is a very, very important election, don't you think? Most definitely. I mean, we have been talking so much about how important it is. And really, I think it's getting more and more exciting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, today, you know, again, less than one month. Um, to go, we want to continue to discuss this important affair. And I think one of the things that maybe we can begin, you know, we always say, let, let's talk something that is fundamental, that's like 101 to help our viewers and listeners. Then we want to look at some of the current affair. And maybe if we can find some application for Malaysia, you know, this three pronged discussion. So the first thing, I think, just the way the American president is being elected the electoral college system. And I, I bet you an average Malaysian wouldn't know what is an electoral college. Exactly. I mean, the whole concept itself is so mind-blowing because it really defies the trending now where a lot of people are saying that, hey, we need to have popular vote. Why mm. isn't a president being, being um, called in just because of... Um, on the basis of popularity. So I think that that itself is such a genius invention of the whole electoral college. Yeah, and when we compare with other presidential system, I mean, we look at Argentina, we look at France, all these are presidential system. And yeah, yeah, it is true popular vote, but they still need plurality of, of votes. But I guess electoral college maybe is more similar to Westminster system. Yes. Because you get representation from... Oh, the, the, the whole country and then the elected representative can choose their leaders and, and kind of remind me of recent, you know, like DAP has a lot of state election right now, right? And some people are saying that it's not democratic because you know how DAP election works, right? You choose the top 20, 25 uh, candidate. So a person could be getting the most vote, but they might not get the top position because you vote in the 2025 and then they will choose among themselves the committee. They, that's actually more like the the communist system. You know, <laughs> like, like, like Polyburo, that's how they, they elect. And I guess Singapore, well, because of their lineage, it kind of like you already arranged who's going to be the next successor and things like that. There, there are pros and cons, of course. But coming back to the American Electoral College, right? I mean, it, it is such a complicated system. But maybe... Um, I mean, instead of going through the whole system, maybe you can just share one or two things that you find interesting about this electoral college. Well, I think... Or some facts also can, you know? Exactly. I mean, I think the what, what what's so unique about this whole United States electoral college system is that, I mean, one, obviously it replaces the popular vote. Mm -hmm. And two, it actually puts the disproportionate voting power in the hands of a relative few states that are evenly divided politically mm. and it, it basically you ensure the majority of the campaign dollars or attention from the pres presidential candidates goes to those states so that's why we have like those swing states and mm. things like that because um, some some states like california texas it's just like so overly populated yep. and yet you have like attention that goes into like smaller smaller states so ensure that their, their voices are being heard as well so i think that's really the genius about this whole mm. electoral college and you mentioned, you know, proportionate, which is, uh, and we, we kind of have the reverse here, you know, because like, like we, we have, you know, like the way the seats are organized in Malaysia, the rural and very rural places really have disproportionate power over the urban. I mean, you look at some of the seats with, you know, a few hundred thousand registered voter and they only get one seat. Whereas certain places you have less than 10,000, you get a parliamentary seat. So you, you need to have some kind of adjustment, some kind of, you know, I, I guess, um, how, how do you determine the, the percentage or weight? 
And so, so one of the facts about the Electoral College now, just, just for your information, the Electoral College basically every state have certain uh, number of Electoral College vote. And then they will all come together to, to choose the president. And the number each state has can change based on their population. So in fact, the last year, the last election, not the last election, the last, uh, yeah, the last uh, presidential election, 2020, a few states, 13 states have their status changed. For example, Texas gained two more and a few states like Colorado, Florida also gained. Big states like Chicago, Illinois, New York, they lost because, you know, people are moving here and there. So it's a very fluid, it's very fair system. Um, but how, how, okay, maybe you can uh, explain a, a little bit about, um, now of course you, you can say, oh, why don't we just appoint uh, 300 plus congressmen and then they choose the president? No, I, th I actually thought it was such a great idea. I mean, the first time that really got me interested about this whole presidential election was that the fact that there is actually debate really, I mean, between the, the candidates mm. and then you begin to like vote because of who you want to put in office. So, yep. so I think the fact that you knew beforehand who is going to be the president mm. if elected, I, I think that makes it so much more interesting than, than Westminster system because here it's like, you're like, you sort of know who is the candidate, but you don't really know also. Mm. So, I mean, obviously we have certain popular figures and things like that, but... But the fact that you knew who and actually people can vote the opposite just because you don't like this person, I think that's yep. really a great idea in this whole whole um, presidential election. And they have many, uh, even within their own party, they have their primaries. And it, it, you know, the whole process basically is like more than a year. And of course, one of the criticism of the American system, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. And really, literally billions are spent. But I guess if you want participation... You need to put in the work. So, but anyway, we'll come back to debate later because, I mean, we, we talked about vice president debate the last episode and a few episodes back, we talked about Trump and Kamala's debate, right? But but it's one of the things for people to 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 ascertain themselves. Uh, but the, the thing about, about coming back to electoral college, of course, is, you know, you, know you have about, you know, how many, a few hundred congressmen so if they are the one to choose president, then it will be very similar to Westminster system. But the Electoral College took one step further because at that time, during the founding era, they found out that a lot of congressmen could be financially purchased. Mm. Bought over, like, like in Malaysia, we, we know exactly what that means. So they are thinking, how can we put in an, another layer? So the genius of Electoral College is, yes, every state have a number based on their population, but then the way the Electoral College voters are determining state to state it is based on their law. So, so that means, let, let's say, for example, like we just look at um, California as one of the biggest, 54. So how do they get 54? Yes, it's based on the result and things like that. But if there's any dispute, it will go back to the state legislature of California. So that means they have ultimate authority who are the 54 people they can send. So this really kind of uh, provide more balance, I guess, between federal and state. So, I, I mean, we, we think about some of the incident in Malaysia. I remember when Sabah and Sarawak status was brought down and some of the Sarawak MP will be like, oh, I, we didn't even know what we were vote, voting for. And remember when Singapore left, that they have a parliamentary session. Singapore didn't even attend, right? And Sabah, Sarawak people went and they were like, what, what's happening? How come we're leaving Malaysia? But you see, with this kind of system, the big states cannot bully the small states. Mm. And, and so, of course, it, it kind of kept changing the, the importance of states. And finally, remember two episodes ago, we talked about this time is a swing states. In fact, the last two elections also swing states. Whoever wins those sevens will get it done. Wow. I mean, it, it, I guess it's really just... I mean, it's something that we can't really comprehend so much here. Mm. Yet it's such um, a system that actually, it, it really gives you a lot of thoughts. How could we actually provide that sort of accountability mm. check into what we have currently? Yep. And I think even the policymakers can really begin to think about all this line. Because, I mean, you, you also have like the extreme where the um, VP pick by 
Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz, that is saying that, hey, we should just abolish this whole mm. thing. I mean, even for someone who grew up with this sort of system, they, they also want to go towards the other direction where it really, really benefits them. And yet here, I, I think I, I like what you were saying, that any politician could be easily bought mm. over. I think that's just a fact of life. I mean, even with earlier on, I mean, with the elect election of the, I mean, the House Speaker will have to be chosen. And even then, I think there's also that sort of, you, you kind of have to like go into this camp or that camp, even if you were still within the Republican Party. Yep. Because, I mean, even in the last episode, we were talking about like the, the different kind of um, the, political the spectrum. Set, yeah, yeah mm. the four camps. So I think you could have those that actually, um, like with this sort of system, it actually provides more mm. check and balance. Yeah, actually the reason why we even brought out this is because uh, Tim Walks just yesterday talked about, you know, he was at an event hosted by Newsom, Governor Newsom of California, of course, you know, potentially one of the future presidential candidates from, from the Democratic Democrats. And they were just saying, you know, the Democrats are the one who kept on saying, let's abolish this because the last few elections, supposedly they have more popular votes across the board. But here you have the same gang of people who are against voter ID, who are against... Uh, you know, just ballot checking. If you want to do ballot harvesting, that means you want to vote for remotely because of COVID, people are able to to do that. But you can't just have a bet. You can't just go to a, a a page, print out, tick, and then that become a legitimate ballot. And it, it, it is applicable in some of the states. That is the reason. You know, we were just talking before the show that when Trump said there is an issue with election because so many laws will change very last minute. Because there's another thing that is very mind-blowing to, especially us here in Malaysia, is that the states, the election laws are determined by the states. That's really crazy, right? So for example, a state A could say, well, Lyra, you don't want to vote. You can just print out a ballot. You put a tick and somebody can come and collect and it's valid. It is valid. You can print a ballot. It's mind-blowing. Another state will be like, nope. You have to show up physically and bring your ID. Your ID has to be certified. It cannot be your school or whatever ID. It has to be government issue ID. No, I think what's also mind blowing is that you don't need a voter ID to actually vote mm. in the United States. I mean, that's unthinkable here. I mean, who who doesn't bring a voter ID to to vote? You know. Well, it's because you know these Western countries because of privacy concern and things like that. They never have a national ID. The closest thing to national ID is driver's license. So even in Australia, they, 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 they actually have a referendum to decide whether they should have an Australian card. And it was voted down like overwhelmingly. No. Wow. So, uh, I mean, that's the, for, for us, it's like, okay, like, you know, we, we are so used to IC, but, but you know how IC can be abused and, and things. Be, before the days of biometric verification, people literally bring photocopy IC and open bank account you know, transfer property and things like that. These are the, the horrors of the AETs and things like that. At, at least these days, banks have uh, biometric. But recently, you know, they, there's a bank um, that they transfer, they took out a lot of fixed deposit, transfer millions of clients' money out because supposedly the bank manager colluded and, and I don't know how they, they overcame the biometric. Wow. Uh, one of the small banks, I can't remember already, and, and I think everyone has been arrested so far. So, yeah, I, I mean, pros and cons of ID, right? I mean, if you can just find somebody's IC, you can even find where they vote, right? You, you go to the... That's true. Yeah, so... But but, but back to, to, to US, they, they just don't want this. But at the same time, with, with so many illegal migrants coming in, you know, we have our own Project IC episode here. Those, those days, they kept saying, you know, how do you beat the system? The, the way to beat the system is you need a higher percentage of turnout. Because let's say you have 70, 80 or 90% in your in your polling center, then it's unlikely someone, some foreigner can come and pretend to be you. Hey, suddenly it's more than 100% of the population. I remember when we do the PACA training, you know, the polling agent, counting agent, they kept saying, look, if you see the name is Chong Akao and you look and that person looks like from, I don't know, Middle East or somewhere, <laughs> then you better something Common should sense. yeah exactly, <laughs> and, and it, it sounds very funny, but in the older days, literally, they will report uh, that 
you, you get all those illegal to come and I, I mean you know Malaysia cheating is kind of ingenious you know you have blackout you have extra bots and things like that so it, it's nothing new it's, but we have voter ID here but don't you think right I mean coming back to the main point I want to talk about that if people are very against voter ID that means they are intending to cheat mm. I mean that's the only conclusion if you're not afraid that, that's why I say the Democrats you say you have three or four million more popular votes, then let it be tested out. Why are you so afraid? So the, the Congress tried to, I think it, the act is called SAFE, S-A-F-E, SAFE Act, tried to require voter ID for national voting, but they don't want to entertain that. But anyway, uh, Electoral College, we can come back again, um, but it's a very fascinating topic. But what, what about some of the things that you have been you're not hearing, you know, like, like what's the current development? No, I think, um, I, I think that, that it's just so interesting that because here you almost, you almost so, sort of always associate, I mean, here as in, in Malaysia, mm. you almost sort of associate all this elec- election campaign with just the politician's job. Mm. I think you, you don't really hear so much about um, the involvement or maybe here, a bit here and there, you have the NGOs involved. But in the United States, you have like one of the largest youth organization, Turning mm, Point yep. USA. And what's so interesting about them is that Charlie Cook, I mean, he he's just basically putting all his resources in Arizona. And when when I listened to his podcast and he was mm. just saying that, hey, actually just in Arizona itself, I mean, they were still tallying up the results. And for last minute voter registration, you have like about 300,000 more yep. Republican that, really, really Mm. went in and vote last minute. And you're talking about this group of people who are likely to turn out on the day of election Mm. to vote because, I mean, you don't don't just suddenly make out your mind like just one month prior to this whole election Mm. and then you say, hey, oh oh gosh, I have to register now. So, I mean, that that means that they must have already made out their mind to like, look, this is very important that I need to vote. So, so the... I think the fact that they put in so much resources and really were able to just tally all these results, it, it's just so impressive. I mean, it's something that I think here in Malaysia we can aspire mm. to to do because at the end of the day, how do you overcome the supposed cheating is really by having more turnout. Mm. So I think what they are really, really doing is that um, like just trying to get more people in and even just them, the grassroots, doing all this thing, it's really like making an impact. So that, that really defies a lot of logic where a lot of people are saying that, hey, my vote doesn't matter and things mm. like that. And yet they have so many results that shows that it is so important that you actually you need to participate. I think you can't really disengage yep. at such a crucial time. I think really the, the theme this year, I mean, especially like when you see worldwide, you have 60 mm. over percent yep. of that of the population that goes into election cycle. And the, the theme is really that you can't disengage from all this thing. I mean, no matter how much you want to be on the fence, you can't, mm. you, you no longer can afford to just be on the fence because what happens is that you have like four years of really like bad yep. economy status. And yet, if you don't choose to do any action now, I mean, just because of your own preference, mm. oh, I don't like this party. I don't like the way to talk. I mean, I don't know if I should be choosing the lesser evil or things like that. <laughs> I mean, those sort of like talk is just like really, really um, utter BS and you should really, really just come in and be engaged in all this thing. And yep. what they have demonstrated is that, I mean, even Charlie Cook was saying, I've been like nagging this person for like like 24 times, but credit to that person, the person finally, finally went register. to yeah, register. So like, there's just so much mm. effort that is really been put in and, and it is very encouraging to really hear that hey, actually what it did really, really matters and that it is just impressive results. Kind of reminded me of Rush Limbaugh. He always said, look, you, you know, how, how do you overcome this kind of thing? It's really one person, one vote at a time because you may be able to influence five person and that's all right. That, that's your sphere of influence. But if you can get more, you know, Charlie Kirk, he, he didn't even attend university, but then he started like a university kind of uh, activism, you know, I, I'm not sure if he will call himself an activist, but that, that's what he did. And because of what happened with Arizona the last round, I, I think they are really passionate to make it right. Now, the other thing about the the recent uh, registration of new voter is it, really how the whole polling works because the last few elections, the polls have been just wrong, wrong, wrong. And one of the things that 
Uh, of course, in 2016, I, I, I think all the posters underestimated Trump, especially Trump voters, because most of Trump voters will not disclose themselves. So in 2020, somewhat uh, ratified, but I, I would argue 2020 is not a good year to to do analysis because of so many changes and things like that. It, it's a bit like the last state election in Sarawak, mm. the, the COVID election, where most of the Sarawakian voters cannot fly back. So you, you can't use that as a benchmark for, for things. But the thing about recent registration, it, it kind of points to likely voter. So that's why you see poll, polling when they do, they should be looking at likely voter, not registered voter. But of course, posters have to do their job. And if they are paid to make their master look good, because you have the external poll, which you should show people where we stand, we are confident. But you have internal poll, and, and which very interestingly, people are saying that, uh, that the Democrat internal private polling are showing that she is in deep trouble in the swing states. Now, this is give you an example. In 2016, when Trump won six to one, he was like Hillary was supposedly leading five to ten points in all the states she lost. So when you you factor in, yes, some of the victory in Michigan, Wisconsin wasn't huge, but Hillary was supposed to have an easy win, and yet she lost by one or two points. She's leading ten points and she lost two points. That means you are twelve points off. So so that that's the kind of thing that really fascinate me because privately you, you have people who kind of show because I see at the end of the day people can show the national now, now we start to can understand right the national poll means nothing <laughs> because you have to win state by state state by state and uh, I mean you look at California look at Texas they're not going to become either blue, uh, blue or red they're going to maintain so you're looking at the swing states so if swing states show Trump is leaving uh, I think I was just I was just reading the other day, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Trump is all trending up, plus two, plus three point. And bear in mind when he was negative five to 10, he still won. So, so what do you make of all these things? I think, I think it is, it is what it is. As in, I mean, because even the Democrat election campaign, uh, they, they are panicking. I mean, you, you have one, potential president who does not even want to give any interview. Suddenly she's like all mm -hmm. out giving a lot of interview and even going to the view. And I mean going to like even what's the um um the the, the daddy podcast, I think. Mm. So I mean like those sort of things like trying to get like maybe more Gen Z to vote or I mean or those people who are like just wanting to follow Taylor Swift. I mean even with Taylor Swift endorsing mm. her, it's not really helping. Actually it's like even damaging Taylor Swift herself. I mean, the reputation. And so with all this thing, I, I actually felt quite positive as mm. in because the fact that the Democrat campaign is panicking and really, I mean, she could have actually done damage control. I mean, but Kamala Harris was just saying that um, because the interviewer was just asking, Did, have you got anything? I mean, if there were things mm. to like rectify over the last four years, is there anything that you want to do? No, I'm, then she just basically said no. I think she just sort of like blew out her chance. Yeah, and, and this is the thing which kind of leads me to what I wanted to say because uh, yesterday, uh, Trump again said, I'm not having a rematch of the debate with Kamala. And of course, he, he says certain things, but the most important thing is what you just alluded earlier, which is uh, Trump was saying, look, and I quote him, he said, Kamala stated clearly yesterday that she will not do anything different from Joe Biden. So there's nothing to debate. So this is the part that I find most surprising because like, you, you know, everyone knows you, you are extreme left, you, you are the leftist, you, you want open borders, you know, all this kind of thing. But in general election, you can at least try to pretend. And, and those are people do, right? You know, like, like in Malaysia, we have usually I'm no general a AGM, you get all those crazy people, curries yielding and things like that. But come to general election, come to uh, mix zone seats, they will say, oh, you know, we have harmony, or, you know, at least some kind of bullshit they will say. But Kamala is not even trying that. And the fact that she says she will do exactly as Joe Biden, it, it, it's like, 
if voters reject Joe Biden, they should reject you even more. Exactly. And that was so different from when she came and she, she tried to position herself as a fresh alternative. I'm just a symbolic vice president. I do not have real power. And, and Joe Biden kind of threw her into the dump, right? And by saying that, oh, by the way, Kamala was involved in every major decision of this administration. <laughs> That's why some people are saying that Joe Biden wanted to sabotage Kamala Harris. I mean, even she herself alluded to, to that as well. I mean, even with the interview, she was just saying that, yes, I was involved in all mm. the major decision making and there's not a single thing that I want to change. So that really shows how much of a character that she is. Do you think it's arrogance or, I mean, I think arrogance and you double down or she's just not in command of the issue? I mean, which is which? I think there's a certain level of disengagement, but probably it stems from arrogance. It stems from the fact that she, I, I don't Maybe know. Maybe all the advisors I mean, around her are telling her everything exactly. is fine, you will win, the fix is in, you know, that, that's the thing. But I, I don't know, I, I, you know, every fix can be overcome. And, and that's why, that, that, that is actually the weakness of the Republican Party, the on the ground. They don't nearly have the same, uh, what, what's the word we use as a community organizer, actually slash community agitator. Or, or the BLM, or all the, you know, people, it's like they are very, very good on the ground. And, and you know, when we look at Malaysia, we, we do have political parties that just, you know, we, we know past runs the ground game very well. Mm. But PKR is like one of the worst. So you, you do need ground game, right? I think so. I mean, I guess they were so confident. I mean, even with like Jewish, American, mm. they were, I mean, traditionally, they are Democrat voters. So, I mean, even with, especially with like, what happened with Otolo 7 and the fact that Kamala Harris is mm. not picking Josh Shapiro. Yep, yep. I mean, and she chose Tim Waltz over Josh Shapiro. I mm. think I think she is really losing ground even within those hardcore supporters of Democrats. Um, you're talking about like those Jewish American. I think they are st starting to like really see that, hey, I mean, maybe Trump is doing more good to Israel than, than not or even to Jewish community as a whole. But she kind of had to choose, right, between the liberal Jews or the Arab, because Arab are kind of important in Michigan, in Minnesota. I mean, those are the states she cannot afford to lose. I mean, talk about Michigan, the uh, Michigan, Minnesota, and in fact, Minnesota is not even considered a swing state. It's quite blue, right? But mm. imagine in Minnesota, you, you lose, that will be unthinkable. But, but she make a choice and it looks like, I mean, time will tell whether tactically it's a correct or, or wrong one. And, and of course, you, you know, they're, they're confident because of all these things. Um, but I'll, I'll say this, there are a few things that kind of put her in, in danger. It's really, I think, uh, once you have the internal war, we, we talk about a few times here, which is the, the liberal Jews and your Arab support Traditionally, they are all going to Democrats, but now they are a bit split. And in fact, you even have a Muslim mayor who came out and support Trump. Then, of course, you have the union, which are typically, you know, Teamster Union, we talk about it for the first time, not endorsing any candidate. Of course, they, they put it like, oh, we're not for, but actually by not endorsing Kamala, you are actually supporting Trump. That's just the way it is. And then, of course, you can't ignore economy. And... And that's why uh, also yesterday, I think, or today, uh, the latest Gallup poll again say economy remains the most important issue. I, I mean, if that's the case, Trump should be winning uh, very handsomely. Uh, but, but why do you think that even though economy is at the forefront of uh, the importance for voters, wh why do you think the polls still show that it's very competitive? I mean, Bill Clinton is the one who say, right, it's the economy is stupid, right? That's his slogan. But, but what, what do you think? You know, it's like, are people not suffering enough? Or, or do, do you think there are seriously people who think Kamala is better at economy than Trump? Or some other reason? I, I, think, um, I think there are two things that I will make out of this. One is that the fact that the whole machinery of the media is actually really, I mean, an extension of Democrat Party. Mm. I think there's just no other way of saying it because the whole mainstream media is just like, I mean, how can they do now? I mean, basically, I mean, are you going to like 
say that admit that hey sorry I make a mistake for supporting this so overtly. Mm. So I think they 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 kind of like oh, were in this. Together. They kind of have to say the economy is great. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they kind of just have to like go along with the flow and really just like, okay, let's just continue to support Kamala Harris. I mean, even with them like fact checking like so rudely in 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 the presidential debate, mm. I think those goes to show that, I mean, that's, that's what they believe in. I think maybe genuinely they do believe that Democrat Party is a better ticket. So I think with mainstream media, I mean, hopefully not all hope is mm. lost. So hopefully they will come around and really just decide to like, hey, let's just make make things right, you know, and let's just have like true journalism come back yep. again. But the thing is, they are so far gone, and they, mm. I think maybe they really, really came under the lie that they they so yep. sell to the people. So I think that's that's the first thing. But secondly, I felt like a lot of the people, I think, because of hardship that they have gone through, and especially if you didn't choose right in. Um, like really going against the whole government machinery and the mm. propaganda of like really resisting the encroachment of government intervention into your life. I think those people are more, I'm not saying all generally, but I'm saying that these people are more susceptible towards like um, being slightly more emotional. Mm. So I think they will vote really, really just based on emotion. Like, hey, yeah. I mean, because she's a female, we're going to have like the first black women president and, and so maybe those sort of things really mm. do affect them I mean, because even even with those liberal jews i mean even with the thing that she's demonstrating i think it's not an easy step for them to like like th there's just so much yeah. emotional so tied that it's just attached to the whole democratic democratic party and not so easy for them to like just leave it as it is so even though the pocket is suffering um really with the inflation results and things like that I think they 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 still kind of like oh, mm. hey I mean there's that longing yep. longing for that what what was comfortable to them I think it's it's something that everyone will just need to come to that place of maturity to just like hey let's just break away from this whole yep. thing and but I think eventually th there will be enough straw to break the back just like what happened happened with Dershowitz right I mean he kept saying that he will vote Democrat but finally he said I'm no longer a Democrat exactly so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, I think our time is out already. And yeah. so I, I think we'll, it, it's very, very near already. But uh, I think the last episode before the election, maybe we can do our prediction. Ooh, <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I mean, we're no poster. But then. No, yeah, it's a feeling. I, I think it, it's good to, to see, you know, based on... Because when you follow the whole news cycle for a while, I, I think it's good to, to see whether you are more objective or you are more emotionally driven mm. by, by different things. But anyway, that will be upcoming in the next few episodes. That will be very, very exciting indeed. So until next time, bye-bye for now. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.